Okay, yep. great. Yep. Thanks so much. Okay. Well, thanks again for having me. It's always a pleasure to be among friends. Um, I say that because among the other things I do at Drexel, I teach a course, and, and I'm teaching it this term. It's called Science Writing, COM 320 slash 520. It's also a graduate course. And in that course, I teach basically some of the things I've been going over in these workshops, uh, how to write concisely, how to write coherently, and I have a chapter on using visual elements in research papers. Uh, and I occasionally get folks like you in that course, PhD students who are trying to get through this task of the dissertation. And um, uh, so I'm, I'm kind of used to your needs and your perspectives, and that's why I'm always glad to visit, um, visit this workshop site. I want to actually take a moment to congratulate the uh, Drexel Graduate Women in Science and Engineering for their award of being the most academically active organization on campus. Nice job. Um, so uh, this is about visual elements. And um, you, know, we, <laughs> you know as well as I do that we, we face a glut of visual stimuli every day, right? Everywhere we walk and every, everything we look at seems to have a graphic and one that moves too. Um, probably a little disconcerting to see a blank screen when somebody starts talking, right? You're so used to, we are so used to seeing images in connection with communication. And that's probably for a good reason because the research shows that we actually learn more from visual elements than we do from verbal elements. So uh, I thought it was appropriate to take one of these workshops. This is the what, fourth of uh, four. Um, and actually I offer six, but we only had time to schedule four this year. <clears throat> but this is why I take at least one of those workshops and devote it to uh, the use of visual elements. Uh, just to want to take a moment to put a plug for my organization. Uh, besides teaching in the College of Arts and Sciences in the Department of Communication, I also have a center called Drexel Edits. And uh, it's a small center here at uh, Drexel that offers pro bono editing services for nonprofits in the area. So for instance, uh, there are various organizations in the neighborhoods that are really small, but they're doing important work. And they can't always afford professional writing and editing services. So. Um, I, I reach out to them and I match them up with my students who've been through my editing course and uh, between the two of them they get together and they produce um, effective, I like to think, effective communication for that organization. <clears throat> uh, if any of you are interested, I know you have plenty of time to do this, uh, if you're interested in, in helping an organization with their communications and you have your own uh, skill set in communications, I'd be glad to match you up. So what I want to do today, in the short time we have, is to um, talk about visual elements. And you know, visual elements have been with us, at least in science, for a long time, <clears throat> um, at least as far back as the 16th century. Folks like Galileo incorporated visual elements into his uh, Sidereus Numcius, which is his book of um, heavenly bodies, and uh, one of them, of course, was the, the moon here that he drew from looking at his telescope. Also, uh, in the same time frame, we had uh, Vesalius, who um, gave us his, one, of, one of the first um, books on anatomy, and his drawings of, um, of the, the human body are really striking, as well as informative. <clears throat> So these things have been with us for a long time. <clears throat> uh, in this workshop, then, I'd like to do this. I, I, want, I hope that you'll be able to walk away with, with these skills, or at least a, a, an awareness of them, <clears throat> and perhaps a, a motivation to, to develop them on your own, uh, to explore and, and explain the importance of visual elements within a text. And that's the key here. It's not just showing you visuals. It's not just showing somebody visuals. but incorporating them <clears throat> into the larger written text. And of course, that's what the dissertation is all about. Um, in line with that, I'd like to say something about where you position visual elements effectively, uh, how do you refer to them with words, 
And then also, how do you create captions for those visual elements? <clears throat> so here's an example of a typical research paper, at least a title page. And um, this is really an interesting one. That I, you know, I don't have an, a deep understanding of any particular science, but it's always curious to, I'm always curious to look through the archives and see what do people study. And this here's a, a study of um, lobster larvae and how they ride on the coattails, so to speak, of um, jellyfish. <laughs> and jellyfish, you know, are kind of these messy things. And so it turns out that the larvae have this process that they go through of picking off debris. Uh, fascinating study. Anyway, um, because it has so much to do with the physiology of an organism, you can imagine that there's plenty of um, visual elements in this paper, and there are. However, they're not like this. This is actually a picture that I <laughs> stole from Google uh, that it represents the adult stage of the larvae. Of course, it has nothing to do with, with this research paper. Um, but you can imagine how tempting it is to use something like this. You know, it's kind of flashy and pretty. And, uh, but it doesn't actually appear in the original paper, and for good reason, because it would be gratuitous. So I'm going to try to make that a part of my spiel here, and that is the graphics you choose, the visuals you choose, should be relevant and not just pretty. So here actually is an example of a graphic that appeared in that study. And it's, of course, a, a simple line drawing of the larvae of the uh, lobster. And this is not a workshop, and I'm not qualified to talk about the creation of a graphic element. <clears throat> and so I'm not going to say whether or not this is a, a, an effective one as a graphic element, but I'm going to point out some of the things that I think make it effective in, in conjunction with the way it uh, exists in the text. So for instance, when you look at things like this, it's almost as though the graphic t can speak for itself. I hesitate to say that too loud because we might be tempted to let it speak for itself, just as we might be tempted to let data, you know, all those numbers you accumulate for your study, uh, let them speak for themselves. But in fact, they can't. But there is a sense in this graphic that there is so much all at once that it almost tells its own story. In fact, <clears throat> when we look at this, you can see that it's giving us a sense of an organism at a particular point in time. It's also showing us the constituent parts of that organism. It shows you spatial relationships among those parts. And of course, you can see that there are depictions of relative size among those parts. So there's lots of stuff going on here if we just look at it casually. And in fact, when you think about it, space, spatial relationships, size, these are actually all the same sorts of cognitive processes that you might go through just to be in the world. And certainly, these are the same cognitive processes that you go through as a scientist. You know, you're, you're looking at spatial relationships, you're looking at relative sizes of things, and you're probably also looking at how organisms or how things uh, behave over time. So those are the same cognitive processes that we see in verbal elements. And therein, I think, is the connection between a visual and a text, which I'd like to exploit today. Of course, another important kind of visual in science, scientific research, um, is the chart which is a wonderful way of taking all those numbers that you've, that you've worked hard to accumulate and make them intelligible to other people. I mean, after all, you may know what those numbers mean, but it would take a long time for someone else to understand what the trends are in those numbers if they only had the numbers. And of course, here we have a kind of instant view of what those numbers mean. Mm. 
So before I go too far with this, let me just give you the abstract and the relevant passages from this paper so that you can sort of follow along. And actually, if you're interested in the whole paper, it's available free online. You just search for this citation. Are you on this? Okay, good. One, two, three, four. Sure. Everybody have a copy? So there are two studies that I'm going to reference in my workshop. The, the first one is the one by Cameo. And then I'll say something about the other one on the other side by uh, Stewart. I apologize if I'm singling out the, the biological sciences here and there are other, other disciplines represented, but I mean, you know how science is universal. We all use the same methodologies and so forth. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so the, 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 these first two uh, graphics, I think, are, are are certainly very common, have been common for a long time. More recently, we have um, a very powerful variation on the visual, and that's the moving image. And this is why, in fact, I picked out this particular research paper, because it included in the research paper, on the online version of it, a video. And I wanted to show that at this time. So here's the paper, actually, as it appears online. And at the bottom, is a moving image of the organism under study. And notice how this adds a dimension to the power of the visual, right? It's not just a still image, it's a moving image, and we can see something happening over time. We can see behavior, we can see movement, uh, something otherwise unavailable in a um, still image. So, how do we integrate elements like this into a text? I think there are some rather simple principles that we can follow to put graphic elements into a, a paper and then to refer to those graphic elements. One of them is simply to place the element in the right position, and that is after you reference it in the text. So if you have a visual element, don't, now, it's easy to say don't because you don't really have the power to, any the power of control over this, but you hope that the journal editor is going to place your image after your reference. So that's a problem. But of course, you can always um, negotiate with the editor if it turns out otherwise, maybe. Anyway, the placement is rather important. You want to see a reference to the element before you actually see the element. Another thing to do is to formally introduce that element. And there are a couple ways of doing that, but you want to have some way of referencing the element, and that means, of course, creating some kind of number or code for it. And then you want to think about what is it that you want the reader to walk away with after they see this element? And that involves how to explain it, uh, what kinds of information, what sort of cognitive process do you want them to go through in order to understand the element. <clears throat> That's the draft stage. 
And then the final stage is to write the, uh, the visual element reference concisely. Uh, we did a workshop on that, on how to write concisely. I would refer you to that. On the other hand, um, it's simply a matter of using as few words as possible to convey your message about the element. Of course, that's a principle you should be doing throughout the paper. All right, so those are sort of general things to consider. And I hope that you'll see some examples of these principles in the example I've shown you. The other thing to consider is, well, how, do you ex how exactly do you refer to visual elements? It turns out that there are two ways, and they're very much like the ways you refer to other studies. Right? There are two ways of citation. One is directly referring to an author of a study that you're connecting to your study by name and putting it as part of the sentence that you're writing. On the other hand, you could do <clears throat> something less uh, intrusive, and that is to use an indirect reference. That is to say, refer to the element in parentheses just as you would in a bibliographic citation. You know, Smith, 2010, page 3, parentheses. So it's rather a simple process to choose between those two. Why would you choose one over the other? Well, it would be a matter of your uh, understanding of what the emphasis should be. If you decide to do a direct reference, notice that now you have to deal with how am I going to uh, place that reference within the structure of that sentence. Now you're going back to English composition. So the reference itself, like figure one for instance, would have to be either a subject or an object within the sentence. Again, it's up to you to determine whether or not you want it to be the subject, which of course would be the, the main emphasis in the sentence, or do you want it to be the object, which would mean it's secondary in importance. Of course, if you use an indirect reference, now you're sort of relegating the reference to the visual element to a very sub, uh, subordinate situation or a subordinate position. Finally, captions. What do we do about captions? So we can reference to the, um, the element, but we should also have some identifier for the element itself because yeah, I mean, you're probably like me. You know, you look at a research paper, and you, you look at the pictures first, right? So whenever I get the new issue of The New Yorker, I always go to the cartoons. I don't read the articles first. So you want the, you want the visuals to have some impact on the casual reader, uh, the, the reader that might look at your abstract and say, well, I'm not really interested, but, wow, that's a pretty picture over there. <laughs> and now you might have them captured, and they might read the whole paper. So you want to have some reference under the visual element that'll tell a little bit of the story. Uh, and in fact, notice that according to this principle, you want to include who, what, where, when. It kind of sounds like journalism, doesn't it? I mean, that's how journalists operate. They're always going after the who, the, the four W's, and sometimes the H and the and the fifth W is how and why. But in the case of captions, it's, I think, enough to just go after those four questions. Who's doing something? What is it? Where is it happening? And when? So with those four answers, you give the reader a kind of complete picture of that visual. Okay, where am I? Ah, all right, so let's pause there and have a look at the side of the handout, <clears throat> which has the abstract for the um, paper about lobster larvae. What I've given you is the citation, the abstract, so you have some background on this. And then, little snippets from the results section of this paper. Now, I, 
you know, I don't have the background to understand this, and I, I dare say, unless you're a biologist, you don't either, but we don't really need a full understanding of the science behind this paper in order to understand the way it uses graphics. So, let's have a look at this. Looking at the results section, what would you say is the method of reference? How are they referencing the visual elements? This is indirect, isn't it? Yeah, because there are in parentheses. So there might be a good reason for that. But notice how it, it kind of relegates the importance of the, of the visual element to sort of secondary, almost as though it's incidental. You know, you're given an example. Oh, by the way, here it is. And maybe, uh, maybe you, don't, you don't want to do that, in which case you may want to go to the direct use of, um, of references. Even the, the video, which you know, seems rather dramatic, <laughs> even that has a kind of indirect reference. Okay. Notice also that um, that this includes the captions for those graphic elements. So we have two that are referenced, one of them, uh, figure one, one figure two, and notice how they are answering, each one of them, I think, is answering those four questions in some way. And so, for instance, they identify the who, or in this case, the agent, the, the larvae. There's an identification of, uh, of, of what. We're looking at external morphology. We have an examination or a, a, an answer to the question of when and, um, and also of where. <clears throat> Likewise, the, the caption for the, uh, the video also answers those questions. Grooming behavior is sort of the what and the when. The larvae is the who. And uh, third, uh, maxilpeds is the, the where. <clears throat> okay. Here's another example of a research paper that I think effectively uses visual elements. <clears throat> so this is a study of zebrafish that they gave uh, ecstasy to. The poor fish, you know. So this is a study of um, the effects of, of a substance on um, an organism. And again, it has, if you look on the other side of this handout, it has a results section that looks at the, refers to the, to the visual elements. Again, they were not like this. I mean, zebrafish are rather pretty, but there was no picture of zebrafish in this study like that. Instead, you had graphics like this, which of course, again, are taking all those numbers that they collected and reducing them down to trends. But I think a more dramatic visual for this paper was this one, which kind of plots the position of the fish in the aquarium <clears throat> before and after they had ecstasy. It was really fascinating just to look at this. And you, like, here's the control. You, know, you can say, well, they're, they're sort of wandering around. But then as the dosage gets higher and higher, you see the fish getting, <laughs> the fish are getting higher and higher. Uh, so it's really a dramatic sort of representation. And you can imagine the, <clears throat> uh, the way that we might integrate this into the text. In fact, we have right here the, the very words that integrate this graphic. And again, you can see the results section <clears throat> using indirect citations or indirect references. And then the captions for uh, figures 1A and 1B, again, kind of tell the, the story that, that answers those questions of who, what, where, when. And then the, the reference 
uh, below those two captions, notice is a um, direct reference. So we have finally one example of a direct re reference. That reference is actually incorporated into the syntax of the sentence. What is that, what is that um, position? What, how, what is the, the function of figure two in that sentence? <clears throat> it is the subject, right? So figure two shows. So you're placing the reference to the, to the visual front and center within that sentence. <clears throat> okay, and then with, um, with the second uh, graphic, again, you have a rather complete ex uh, description of the who, what, where, when of that graphic. So um, there's, there's not a whole lot more to say about graphics. What I'd like to do is give you a chance to sort of um, work, work with graphics in an example that I've put together here. Another one from biology, but it's rather, I think, a fairly simple and easy to understand study. It's determining which jump higher, fleas from cats or fleas from dogs. And I picked a short one. This is actually a research letter, not so much a research paper, uh, so that you have, uh, you wouldn't have to spend too much time on, on reading it. But I, what I'd like you to do is to consider writing your own in-text references for this paper. So there's two of them. There's figure one and figure two. I'd also like you to write your own captions for those references. Notice what I did. I just took out, the <laughs> took out the captions. And I also took out the references, I think I did anyway, to the papers. And if you happen to have your laptop with you, go to this website, um, and there's a Google Doc with, with this paper, and you can insert your own caption anonymously, uh, and then we could all see and, and we can share each other's captions and references. <clears throat> Whoops. Forty-four years after the debate about how I couldn't help myself. I wanted to see actually what would a flea look like when it was jumping. Isn't that amazing? Okay. So take some time to create your own captions and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about them.
so that I don't overstay my welcome, uh, I thought we would take a minute now just to go over a few of your, of your examples. Anybody have a, an example of, an, of a reference to <clears throat> this graphic? Well, with either well, either one. Um, do you want to? Can you give me a caption or or a reference? Percentage distribution of the jump length observed for C chemis chemis and C chemis. Good. So is that a caption? Yeah. Okay. Good. Notice how his caption gave us the answers to those four questions. Right. We find out. Who, who this is about, <laughs> if you want to stretch the term. Uh, you find out what's going on, the jump, right? And you find out uh, the when, the, the, uh, the, the time that these um, measurements were made, and the where. Uh, so that a, a person just looking at the graphic could get a sense of what the study is about. Does anybody have a, a reference, a, 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 a written reference to this graphic that you'd like to share, and where where would you put it? <clears throat> in the results section. The results section, okay. Yeah. And and do you have a sentence for that? Uh, so I, I would reference it indirectly, uh -huh. I guess, like right after the finished describing the data that is in that paragraph. So right after it says like mean jump length, the And then just what, like, like figure, figure one. yeah, okay, good. Did anybody create like an, a direct, a direct reference to, um, to the visual? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, figure one shows the distribution. Yes. Of the, uh, fleas from the different species and the height which they were able to cover. Good, good, yeah. So notice how that tells a rather complete story about the, the visual. Yeah, and in your case, it would be direct. You notice that he put in uh, into that sentence. He used the figure one as a subject, so it was front and center. Uh, I mean, after all, you put all this work into your data. You may as well get some attention to it, right? So I think that was a good move. Uh, notice, by the way, that the way this thing is laid out in the in the, in the published article uh, doesn't particularly conform to our rules, does it? Uh, it? It wouldn't have been that much trouble, I don't think, for the editor to move the graphics so that they came below the, ref the results section where you're actually referencing them. And I think that would have been an improvement on this paper. So, all right. Well, as you can see, it's a rather simple um, principle, a rather simple set of principles to incorporate graphics into your papers. Again, it's a matter of, it's like anything else in writing, it's a matter of just consciously doing these things and practicing them as you might practice uh, golf strokes or um, uh, tennis moves. So thank you for your time. Anybody have any questions on this? Um, if you have any questions about the materials that I'm using or, or my slides, just send me an email. I'd be glad to share them with you. Thank you. How to write better. Oh, marvelous. <laughs> so, oh. Yeah, thank you so much again. Oh, thanks. thanks. Uh, how did you know I'm a chocoholic? Yeah. Uh, I just assume everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, this is very kind of you. Yeah. And good luck to all of you. I'm sure you'll succeed in your programs. Yeah. Thank you. So this is our last writing boot camp, but if you're on next year too, we'll probably have a similar set of students if Dr. Shatter is still um, willing to teach us again. Sure. I'd be glad to. Thanks.